thank you for doing this. I'm, how are you? Thank you so much for coming. All right, so um, I, I actually do want to start uh, and let both of you, Michael, if, if both of you can talk about your organization so the audience knows um, what State Armor and, and um, Glo American Global Strategies actually are and what they do. So my name is Michael Lucci. State Armor is a nonprofit organization. We focus on enacting state solutions to global security threats. Of course, global security threats, it's the Communist Party of China. There are Iranian operations that occur in the states, there are Russian operations, but far and away, it's the Communist Party of China. So we do solutions for protecting critical infrastructure, protecting state supply chains, and then shutting down influence operations, which are really becoming pervasive across the states. Okay, it, it, Brian, before you jump in, because I, I know your background, Michael, what's your background? My background is, is state policy and politics. So I was the policy chief for the governor of Illinois a couple years ago. A lot of different think tanks, tax, regs, labor policy. Uh, I just started seeing a gap at the state level. So you would see the federal government do something like, let's get the federal pensions out of China. Meanwhile, the states are throwing as much pension money into China as they can. That's one easy example of where this gap exists, where the states were not aligned with our national interest, not really to their own fault. Uh, so aligning them better with the federal direction but then also it became very apparent that there are, uh, China has a subnational strategy, so China targets the states in specific ways. So the more we dug into it, the more we realized that there are problems that we have to combat at the state level, and that turned into what's now state armor. And Brian, American Global Strategies. Well, thank you very much. Uh, Brian Cavanaugh, I'm with American Global Strategies as a senior vice president. Uh, that's a small business consulting firm. It's founded by former National Security Advisor Robert O'Brien and his former Chief of Staff Alex Gray. And you know, I, th I thought I'd uh, cap my career working at the National Security Council for three years, but uh, you know, Robert called me after the uh, my end of my time at the NSC and said, "I stood this firm up. Thought I was going to be doing a lot of international focus, but our clients are asking a lot of questions about homeland security, critical infrastructure security, crisis management." and you were the lead for all of our Homeland Security focused work. Would love to have you come help advise companies on how to protect their infrastructure and have continuity with their operations. Nice, so Michael, you mentioned pensions, which there was kind of an, an aha moment just because I haven't actually thought about that before that I do know the federal government has worked very hard for divestment, but China, can you talk about how China's kind of targeting states and state policy to get people and states tied to China? So they have subnational influence strategies. I'll note that when uh, President Xi met President Biden in San Francisco in November, they had kind of a declaration afterwards. What do we want to do together? One of the things the Chinese side stressed was they want more subnational cooperation and connections. There's a reason for that. On their side, it's all centralized. So when they create, say, sister city agreements, which exist in most states, I mean, Indiana just prohibited them with foreign adversaries but they exist with most states. That's all centralized on their side. It goes through an organization that uh, reports to the Central Committee of the Communist Party. On our side, it's just, you know, cities making friends, things like this. They then operate with those sister city agreements to influence those po local politicians, and they, they hope to cultivate them as they rise. Arguably, you know, the current uh, vice presidential candidate has been cultivated in some ways over decades, really. Um, with, with Chinese influence operations. That's one example though. I mean, you hear about police stations, they'll still exist. They, they set up these centers that they say are ostensibly to help Chinese citizens who are living in the United States. They're to monitor, harass, and suppress Chinese citizens who say the wrong things while living in the United States. One example, they had an operation called Operation Fox Hunt. The purpose of this was to find Chinese nationals in America saying the wrong thing force them to go back to China, and then, you know, God knows what happens to them from there. Uh, and they would threaten their family to get them to go back. They would do all sorts of things. That's a violation of about 12 different parts of our United States Constitution, and it happens on our soil. Wow. So, Brian, your national security background, when we talked earlier in the green room, I've been waiting to ask you this question when you got up here. Thirty-five to 50,000 military age Chinese men crossing the southern border that we know about in just the last year or so, extraordinary numbers. Um, 
one, obviously, I think it, it's something we should be concerned about. But, I mean, do you see this as people fleeing or, or is, may there be something else going on? I think that's a, a really interesting point. If you pull back the layers of the onion and really look at that, um, I, sat, I spent a lot of time with Tom Holman last fall looking at just at that point, I guess it was two and a half years worth of data. And we were looking at 18 to 45 year old males that did not come into the country with families that came in as individuals. How many were there? And our most conservative number that we could come up with, the lowest number, was 3.1 million. Ooh, wow. And that number, when you compare it to how many law enforcement the country has, we're talking about 780,000. Uh, you look at the military roles, uh, it's about a million. And then you think about that, that includes your active reserve, your reservist, active duty. Well, some of your reservists are also double counted in law enforcement. So the numbers should actually be very terrifying to people. And, and couple that with, the, they're using the border as an operation to move not just people, but also fentanyl. You have human trafficking. To answer your question, I think it's a mix. There are people fleeing China, and there, there are people who are trying to get out for all the right reasons. The downfall is, they, as Michael mentioned, they have such a co coordinated system in place in the United States to monitor, track, and influence those dissidents uh, that they're, they're, they're at, I think one of the ways we frame it, and it's really important to look at this, is that the number one victim to the Chinese communist people are the Chinese nationals themselves. So even if you're able to escape and you come to the U.S., you're still under the watchful eye and you're still going to be influenced. Now, it, I know one of the issues that we've pushed domestically in this country that we're trying to get others to embrace is being weary of Chinese technology and um, what, whether it's uh, not just TikTok, but whether it's drones, cameras for surveillance, things like that the Chinese dumping those cheaply to this market. Is, is that concern, is, is it legitimate that we should be worried about those? I think one of the, the stories I could share about my time at the National Security Council is uh, the I-25 corridor where most of our ballistic missiles are kept. Um, it's very rural, it's very, um, it's not a major urban area that has a lot of money to throw into the uh, TV markets. So companies, media stations, were looking for cameras, for weather cameras, and they were going to put them on top of these radio towers. And Huawei came in and was like undercutting everyone by half, 50% what all the other 4K cameras were offering. And they were like, oh, not only are we going to cut the price this low, we're going to give you all these features you didn't even ask for. It's great technology. Well, they put them all up and down the I-25 corridor along U.S. military sites. And these, radio, these, these Huawei equipment had the ability to capture DOD signals. Uh, we remember how upset everyone got over a balloon flying over the country. These were cameras all over the I-25 corridor. And in October of 2020, um, Ambassador Robert O'Brien came to me and said, I don't care if you have to rent a U-Haul and take a Sawzall and go out there and cut these things down. They need to be down by the end of the week. So we have to figure out whatever it is we have to do to get them down. And, and that's the difference between administrations. A lot of administrations, the current one included, want to study the problem and do a report on it. Uh, the Trump administration was, go get me the results, go do the work. And that was, just to give you an example of the tempo. And I think I just mentioned the balloon. On the southwest border today, we have about a thousand drone incursions a month. These are everything from what you would see as a DJI recreational drone to military grade drones that the cartels are using to help influence how they're going to move people, how they're going to move fentanyl. They're building pattern of life recognition on our CBP officers. They're using facial recognition. They're tracking their pattern of life. This is all being coordinated, not just the drones, but the IT behind it by the Chinese Communist Party. So this is very well or orchestrated. And one of the things I think people don't, they fail to realize is in the West, we look at a conflict as weapon systems firing. We're shooting ammunition at our enemy. The enemy's shooting ammunition at us. We are in an active conflict with China. We just don't see it the way we would traditionally see a conflict. Instead of bullets flying, they're trying to undermine the economy, they're trying to kill Americans with fentanyl, and they're trying to influence us by surrounding politicians at the local and state level and hoping to be able to influence international politics. If I could add on to that, because actually this I-25 story is one of the reasons Brian and I ended up coming together, and we work together in a lot of state houses to enact policies. Um, one of the things that first turned me on, there, there's a CNN article from 2022, uh, and it shows a map of the state of Nebraska, Colorado, and Wyoming. It has a dot for everywhere where there's a nuclear missile silo. And then it's shaded red 
wherever the service area is uh, covered by Huawei equipment. Our entire nuclear uh, fleet there is surrounded by Huawei on all sides. So this article is in CNN. It was very clearly like a leak from the FBI. It says that the FBI assesses that they can intercept our nuclear signals. Um, and so the federal government has a program to rip and replace this. It's five years in, I think it's 12% done. So this spy equipment's still out there. So the state of Nebraska, and this is, this is kind of where state armor goes, state of Nebraska passed a law telling the telecom provider, you rip it out today, you have a $10,000 daily penalty until you rip it out, and you're ineligible for any public distribution of funds until you rip it out. And so that's the opportunity we take advantage of, is states are very nimble, they're very quick, and you know, I've, I've loved seeing Brian and other folks come into state houses, and they testify, and then they vote, and you know, they kind of say, what happened? And I said, well, it's a law now. Like, they, they did it, versus in D.C., you know, these things take two years, three years, five years. So the states can be very reactive, and we need them to be very reactive and, and proactive in cleaning out these uh, areas of influence operations. So, Michael, um, how do you view these uh, land acquisitions in the country? I mean, there are states passing laws prohibiting, um, for example, China owning land. Uh, is it as big a problem as it's advertised that China coming in buying up large tracts of land? The size of the tract is not as important to me as where it is. And so it's near military installations. So I'll give you one story from Texas. A former general of the People's Liberation Army bought 140,000 acres. So this is actually a big piece of land uh, near our border with Mexico. It's also 10, 15 miles from Laughlin Air Force Base. The state of Texas finds out about this, you know, asks him what he's doing. He says he wants to put up wind turbines, 700 foot tall wind turbines. There's no wind there. So in Texas, there are lots of areas with a lot of wind and it's graded one to 10. This area is a two with 10 being there's a lot of wind. So why does he want to put up 700 foot tall surveillance, you know, poles 10, 15 miles from Laughlin and same distance from our border where they're probably running fentanyl across. Um, so it's the location of those purchases that's more important to me. I think New York Post had an article maybe a month ago where they showed a map of the United States. They showed here's where our military installations are, here's where China's buying land. It's just right next to every military installation. If there was ever a kinetic conflict, without a doubt, those positions where they have surface area next to our military installations would be used to throttle any sort of projection of power that we would try to put in place. And, and to pull the thread a little bit further, in addition to military installations, what we're also seeing, we saw this year as we traveled the country, meeting with states in Indiana, for example, um, was it Fu Fang? Fu Fang was attempting to purchase land that straddle both sides of a very critical choke point on U.S. rail infrastructure. That, that's key for U.S. commerce, and it's also used by the military to move uh, assets between two key military installations as well. So they're targeting civilian critical infrastructure, and just to give, kind of put a cap on that, in 2018, uh, we pushed really hard to get out of the Open Skies Treaty, which is a Cold War era treaty to monitor new military sites to see what's going on in nuclear capabilities between the Soviet Union, or now Russia, and the United States. And our European allies are like, oh my goodness, why are you trying to get out of this, this treaty? If you guys get out, there's no reason Russia will stay in for us to be able to have those capabilities. And we had to explain to our European allies, the intent of this was to be able to provide that transparent look at military installations so that we could understand nuclear capabilities. However, for the last several years, we've noticed as they're flying, their patterns are tracking civilian infrastructure. The electric key parts and assets of the electric grid, they're following the pipelines, they're following telecommunications and fiber optic channels, and they're collecting on that. That's asymmetric warfare, that's not something the United States was engaged in, and so we've worked really hard and took a lot of flack, and in 2019 finally got out of the Open Skies Treaty, and I think that's just a very small step in the right direction towards protecting civilian critical infrastructure. I, I have to tell you that people ask me what's the one thing that keeps me up at night. It's every time I hear of a cyber incident, I know how bad it is, that how, how compromised we truly are, and I'm expecting the worst. When the Colonial Pipeline situation occurred, I truly expected that to be a, an attack on our SCADA controls, and what it was was a, an attack on the billing capability for Colonial Pipeline. 
Um, so for me, I, I know the things that are at risk, and I'm terrified every night when I go to sleep. I'm like, I don't want to wake up and see that it was the grid that was turned off. Um, we do planning assumptions at, uh, in the federal government for what do we do during an event where we lose power for an extended period of time. I was there in Puerto Rico four months after the storm hit Puerto Rico and they were still without power. I would not wish that on any part of the United States. And if you take down the grid, you're talking about half the country going black for six, six weeks to six months. If I could pull the string on the Fufang. So Fufang is a Chinese agriculture sort of grain company. Um, they were chased out of the state of North Dakota because the Secretary of the Air Force described them in a public letter as a clear national security threat. Fufang was trying to put up a grain silo, I think 12 miles from Grand Forks Air Force Base, where I think our kind of top drone technology operates out of there. Uh, I apologize if that's not exactly what's there. So they were chased out. This is six months later, we're testifying in Indiana on a land bill, and the land bill is just saying we're not gonna let, uh, you know, Chinese entities buy land, and we were being fought behind the scenes by the Indiana Economic Development Corporation. That's a public entity. That's their eco deco. Like they're, they're, you know, it's the org that's supposed to bring businesses in. And the sponsoring senator, who knew a lot of those folks, said, "You know, w what's your problem with this bill?" They said, "We have 11 deals with Chinese companies worth 14 billion dollars that we're trying to land right now to bring them into Indiana." And she asked them, can you name one of those companies? And the only name they would volunteer was Fufang. There's a letter, I mean, you could Google Secretary of Air Force Fufang. There's a letter out there that says that this company, we can, cannot let them in. It's a clear national security threat. And as Brian said, they were trying to be on top of the rail lines in Northwest Indiana. So that bill cleans Fufang out. We happen, so we're telling this story in Ohio. Uh, the, we're in 15 states in our first year. So we're telling the same story to lawmakers in Ohio. And the lawmakers say, Fufang, I think I know that name, goes into her email. She sees emails from their economic development corporation about bringing Fufang into Ohio near a military installation. So they're just bouncing state to state to see where they could get close to our critical assets that they could compromise. We just happened to come across them bouncing state to state because we were operating in those states. There's a whole bunch of states we don't operate in, so who knows what they or these other Chinese companies are trying to do in those states. Go ahead. And I think to give Michael credit in what State Armor is doing is, is really unique and it's actually been really impactful. What are we, nine months, ten months in? And I, I really truly believe that the states are the nimble, agile governments that can respond and, and provide that first tip of the spear against this threat. And what Michael's done and what states are doing is they're actually creating an opening for the national security intellect inside the, the Capitol Beltway to get out of D.C. and come share the stories with states and empowering states to be that force of action, to, to take the steps necessary. And, and I, so I, I was sitting here thinking about some of the comments I've made, and it's been all doom and gloom, and I, I don't want to leave you with a bad impression of who I am or where we're at as a country, but I'm really, I'm my... What I'm in, encouraged by is how proactive the states have been when we come share information with them, how quickly they're able to put legislation together, how quickly they're able to move it. They get their different stakeholders at a table and they make changes. So those are the things I think are the big win. And for too long, DHS is, you know, I look at things that CIS is doing and CIS is trying to be everything but what it's supposed to do. They're everything from a misinformation board to censoring um, and, and instead, they should be building the relationships at the state and local level with your civilian critical infrastructure to figure out how they can help mitigate and harden that infrastructure. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm, I'm, well, I'm glad you said that because I've been sitting here saying, okay, the whole room is terrified now. Is there anything to be optimistic about in, in how we're pursuing this? Uh, one of the things that I think has come up, and, and Senator McConnell raised this yesterday, and a couple others raised it, is that in Washington, however long it takes, there does seem to be bipartisan buy-in that we have to do something. This isn't a partisan issue. Is that y'all's impression? That is definitely my impression uh, of Washington. Um, there is a little bit of a disconnect at the state level. I think it's, to some extent, it's because, you know, we clearly come from the right, and so we go into a state, and they're like, okay, this is some MAGA org. Um, and so we bring in people who look like Democrats. <laughs> And so we're in Colorado, for example. So we, when you go to Colorado, you make your hair purple? <laughs> no, no, I mean, we bring in, 
we have some um, really incredible experts who are women who look like they're on the left, even though they're not. <laughs> and so, you know, so we operate in Colorado because of the Huawei issue. Huawei, uh, Colorado has some of those nuclear silos surrounded by Huawei as well. So we're just trying to do one bill in Colorado. We we're just trying to do a one off to d clean out that issue. And so we had a lobbyist and he's like, look, you know, you and Brian, the, he, he said like, don't bring you, don't bring Brian. And there's this woman, Jacqueline Deal, uh, Kelly Curry's another one. Um, and he's like, they, they'll, they'll do well. And so Jackie testified actually remote, um, just all went unanimous. Um, first of all, Jackie's an incredible expert and you know she conveyed what they're doing with Huawei and everything like that um, and the entire it, it went through you know both chambers unanimously because once you have the right messenger the message is clear like this is what they're doing is clearly a problem if you just put the right messenger out there both sides will act I will say on the other side uh, the governor of Arizona has vetoed some bills that just boggle my mind I mean we put a bill through that said uh, medical payments providers in the state will not reimburse for any organ transplant that originates in China. I will say of note, I think the first person who survived one of these organ harvests, I think went public yesterday in DC. He was, you know, he woke up chained to a hospital bed in China and they'd taken out part of his lung, part of his liver. He somehow survived, he's over here in the States. So they do this, they, you know, take organs from these Falun Gong folks and they give them to, you know, party officials or whatever. They give them to foreigners a lot too. So we had a bill that just said the state medical payment systems will not reimburse for that. Texas did it, other states did it. She vetoed that bill. I still don't know why she vetoed that bill. She just thought it was a partisan issue somehow. Um, but it, it just said no payments can go to reimburse uh, organ transplant that originates in China because they take the organs from these political dissidents. So there is a disconnect with some Democrats, but if you get the right messenger, um, one of the reasons why I hope Biden loses is there's one person on his National Security Council who I think is quite good, and we could get him to go into blue states, and then they would pass a bunch of laws. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm still hung up on the actual, like, we have a survivor of, well, I mean, we, we've heard these rumors for years, this is what they do, and we have a survivor that they took part of his lung and liver, and, I mean. That, that's my understanding. I just saw geez. the headline. I asked some of our team to run it down. But I will say, um, you know, we've met so many people. It's been kind of this field of dreams effect because we built out a lobbying operation and we write bills and we just put them through lobbyists. That's how I met Brian mm -hmm. and Alex and Robert O'Brien, all these folks, is they saw what we were doing and they said, like, call me and testify. Um, the Falun Gong folks who have a lot of, you know, operations, they're, they're here in the United States. They heard about our legislation. They come out and testify. Um, I lost my cousin. I lost my aunt through this organ harvesting, and then I fled the country through Thailand or whatever it was. Um, so they tell those stories as well. So it, it, priorities, if, if you've got to organize priorities of, of what do states need to be thinking about right now, what do people in the room need to be thinking about encouraging their state legislatures, what, where should people be going? What's, what's the easy, low-hanging fruit first? If I may, I think that the first one that I would look at and Michael's team put together is a Pacific conflict stress test. So in the federal government, we're always planning for bad case scenarios and trying to, you know, you've heard the military has planners, well there's resilience planners in the NSC that are always looking at what could happen if a storm hits, what happens if there's conflict here or there. Uh, Michael put together a bill that drives the states to look at and assess what will be impacted in the state from an economic standpoint, from a critical infrastructure standpoint, and from an investment standpoint in the event that we have a conflict in the, in the Pacific, uh, China, Taiwan conflict. And I think it lays out a really clean path on how to do that, what to look for, and it gives the governor options to be as forward leaning as they wanna be. And I think that's one where we've seen it adopted by states through legislation and through executive orders. And it's, it's already, you know, here we are less than six months later and they're starting to bear fruit on those, those projects. Governor Stitt, who spoke yesterday, he's the first governor to do the stress test via executive order. Uh, so that was an incredible start. It's a model for other governors to look at. Um, so yeah, the stress test, to me, you know, when we came into that, we looked at the pandemic. The governors were the front and center operators during the pandemic, emergency operators. 
there was really no way for them to see that's coming. Uh, but if they had known that was coming, they could have prepared, stockpiled, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we can see that this might come. I mean, China just ran its third simulated invasion of Taiwan in May, I believe, where they surround the island, they practice a blockade, they pro practice invasion. And President Xi's been pretty open. He says, we're not passing this issue down. This issue being forcibly annexing Taiwan. We're not passing this down to the next generation. Um, so it's very clear this could occur. And if it were to occur, the disruption at the state level, I would guess, would be about 10 times what it was during COVID. Um, much of our pharmaceutical supply chain is, originates in China. Power transformers originate in China. So on supply chains, what if that's cut off? How does the state government operate? on critical infrastructure, I will give the, the Biden administration credit. Um, they've been quite loud in 2024 of coming out and telling state leaders, you will be attacked. You are being attacked right now. Uh, the National Security Advisor sent a letter out to every governor on March 18th, and it said they are attacking your water infrastructure right now. Here's an example of China, here's an example of Iran. Um, and so they want to be able to take down your water infrastructure because it could cause massive chaos because you can't clean the water, you can't drink the water. Um, so those are the types of things we want to work out ahead of time. How could they attack critical infrastructure? Harden that now. What supply chains would break? Harden that now. And what we've heard, because Nebraska did this as well, and Nebraska's been fantastic on so many of these issues, lawmakers in Nebraska were told by some military leaders in Nebraska that the more states that show this very clear, obvious hardening process, the more states that will do that, the less likely there will be a conflict because China will actually see that readiness being enhanced. Well, that's encouraging, at least. Um, so how many states are already starting to do this? What, what, what are the numbers? Do you know? So three have started the stress test. That's Arizona, Oklahoma, and Nebraska. This was, I mean, this was our first year of operation. Mm -hmm. So we just took whatever bills we could anywhere. Um, going into 25, that's our number one priority, is just enhance that readiness. And our number two is uh, Foreign Agent Registration Act, which Georgia actually passed, uh, but then the governor vetoed, I believe, at the request of the sponsor because it was very broad. Um, I think that states should register foreign agents of adversary nations only. And there's, you know, keep a sort of constrained focus, but China has these operations within many states that clearly are foreign agent operations. The federal government's not taking care of it, sometimes because they don't mess with nonprofits. There's kind of an exemption for that. Um, so target these foreign adversary operations within states, make them register, make them be transparent about their finances and everything like that, as any other foreign agent should be. So Michael, why aren't you working faster? I mean, <laughs> um, so, okay, well, th this is good here because uh, so many people here from, are from Georgia that uh, we can put pressure on our state to act. Um, let me ask you before we wrap up, for, for a long time there was the conversations about the Confucius Institutes in the country, are, are those still a problem around the states or have we mostly dealt with that? That is a serious threat still today. Um, we, they are changing the name because a lot of things- I was gonna ask, are they just changing the name and rebranding? Rebranding, yeah. it's all rebranding at this point, but a lot of your universities, um, that's how do you undermine our, our economy? You have to, they don't have innovation. Innovation is not something they teach in their school system. It's the way they teach, the way they're structured, innovation does not come naturally. So they need to send people to the United States, study, do the research and development and get the ideas and bring them back home. So that's happening actively. It is, uh, as we use Thousand Talents Program, Confucius Institutes, again, the name's gonna change every six to 12 months because they're gonna try and avoid whichever legislation's naming a specific um, institutional organization. But the practice happens and it's, it's full throttle. Okay, uh, we've got about a minute and a half left. Y'all have any final thoughts that you think the crowd needs to know what they should pay attention to or what should they do to, to try to get their legislature involved? I, I think legislatures are doing a really good job and actually Georgia's led on land, procurement, a number of other issues. I think Georgia, I think, never had pensions over there, if I recall. We're not in Georgia yet. We will be hopefully by the end of this month. Um, Georgia's done quite well on this. I think Georgia has one of the only ports in Savannah that I think does not have any ZPMG cranes. ZPMG cranes are, um, it's essentially spy tools to monitor what's going in and out of every port. So bad that Biden actually issued an executive order to rip all of them out across the entire United States. I think Savannah avoided ever having those cranes, if I recall correctly. Um, I think that states, so China has a state strategy 
we just have to reverse it. And they feel that pain. We know they feel that pain because whenever certain bills pass, they kind of reach out to us in various ways. So they care about uh, states acting to harden themselves. That tells me states should keep doing it. All right, Michael and Brian, this has been super. Okay, I got to be honest, this is way more scary than I expected it to be, but also encouraging given the progress that's being made. Thank you both for your hard work and thank you for coming to the gathering.